Hello, welcome listeners and market participants. Thank you very much for joining KBRA's European Credit Podcast, Conversations in European Credit. I am Gordon Kerr, Head of European Research at KBRA, and today I'm joined by a number of my colleagues from the Financial Institutions Ratings Team here at KBRA. Welcome, Asha Drobnik. Uh, thank you. Great to be here. Claudia McPherson. Hello. Good to be here. Leah Halfors. Hi. Good to be here. And Patricia Cantwell. Thank you, Gordon. Today, we will be covering the topic of asset managers, alternative asset managers focused on private equity and private credit strategies have proven to be fundamentally strong as asset classes largely owing to their resilient business models that enable these financial institutions to better navigate the more challenging conditions. The current operating environment presents some challenges to the market, including high interest rates, persistent inflation, weaker economic performance, and regulatory changes. Although fundraising and investment exits can be pressured in a weakening economy, fee-paying assets under management are not susceptible to redemption or net asset value risk, given that these funds are dominantly closed end with long lifespans. Management fees tend to be quite resilient and predictable for well-established private equity and private credit focused managers. In addition, most firms currently benefit from what is referred to as dry powder that can be deployed during a downturn and which often translates to strong returns over the medium to longer term. KBRA has published a wide-ranging research reports on private credit that provide insight on the latest trends in landscape. And today we are going to dig into one in particular. So, so let's shed a little more light on the topic of asset managers. Asha, can you tell us more about the KBRA rated asset manager universe? Absolutely. We started our coverage with first rating back in 2019 and currently rate 47 asset managers, more than double the number we had at end of 2021. We expect to move closer to 50 rated names by year end, but this mainly depends on market conditions for debt issuances, where our ratings are typically used for. Proceeds from debt issuances are primarily used to help fund co-investments and platform acquisitions, but may in some cases be used to fund partners' pay. We have a pretty unique view of this asset class. Our coverage mainly encompasses PE and private credit managers or a combination of some sort, which account for over 60% of our portfolio. Most of these managers have investments diversified by sector, although we have a representation that mainly targets the technology sector. Within the credit focus space, we also have CLO managers and hedge funds. The remainder of our coverage, just below 40%, includes mainly firms focus on real estate and those focus on infrastructure, as well as more traditional wealth managers. Majority of our rated asset managers are based in the US, but almost one quarter of our coverage are European and Asian firms. So why are the alternative asset managers fundamentally stronger than most of the other financial institutions that are looked at? To put it simply, they have resilient business models. As AUMs are not susceptible to redemption or NAV risk, given that most funds are closed end with long lifespans. And because of this, they benefit from quite resilient and predictable management fees. This is particularly the case for well-established PE and private credit platforms. In many cases, these management fees are supplemented by the ability to generate substantial carry and co-investment returns over time, although there can be significant quarter-on-quarter volatility. A flexible cost base also adds to the resiliency of these firms. So recognizing these comparative strengths, as well as relatively modest debt levels at management companies, average rating of KBRA's portfolio is in the single A category. However, our rated universe expands from institutions in the double A rated category to non-IG firms. 
all managers in AA rated category have AUMs exceeding $70 billion, but single A and triple B rating categories incorporate firms with wildly different AUMs from under 15 billion to over 70 billion. Let me give you some examples here. At the higher end, we rate an asset manager with leading European franchise and significant global activities, showing diversification of strategies, portfolio investments, and investor. We can see consistent performance track record, a disciplined investment approach, and strong alignment of interests with fund LPs. Conversely, at the lower end, we rate small and niche-oriented well-management firm that is subject to redemption and enough risks. Claudia, now turning to you, considering the much publicized market headwinds that we are currently facing, how are KBRA rated asset managers performing? Gordon, 2022 was a real life stress test for asset management firms, and KBRA rated asset managers performed very well. Despite the large and broad market value declines, AUM actually grew 8% on average in 2022 and is on track for slightly higher growth in 2023. This growth was primarily due to the majority of our rated firms experiencing positive fund flows, which reflected investors' continued support of this asset class by investing capital into new funds. And in most cases, these inflows exceeded any AUM declines coming from portfolio valuation write-downs. Revenues for asset managers come primarily from management fees, which are calculated as a percent of committed or invested capital. So existing funds combined with this AUM growth is generally supportive of earnings. In 2022, management fees represented a large 69% of total revenue. Remaining revenues come from more variable sources, such as carried interest and performance fees. And it was mostly here that we saw the effects of the adverse markets, especially in a decline in realized carry. As portfolio company valuations were written down and exit opportunities became more difficult. At KBRA, though, we factor this revenue variability into our rating process by incorporating an extreme stress scenario where we usually exclude carry and co investment gains. And as a result, our ratings incorporate these more adverse environments, such as those experienced in 2022. In our research piece, we lay out a few of the specific ratios we focus on in our analysis, which include EBITDA margins, debt to EBITDA, and interest coverage. In all three metrics, we saw the effects of slightly weaker earnings in 2022 versus 2021 and an anticipated rebound in 2023. Overall, our rated firms have strong financial metrics, and they continue to reflect the resilience of the asset manager's business model. Great. Asha touched on the diversity of the KBRA rated asset managers. Does this really come through in their financial profiles? Yes, we do see that the various business models result in some differences when looking at these key financial metrics. Uh, For example, PE focused managers usually have higher relative EBITDA than other strategies. And this is owing to their higher management fees, which are earned on committed and invested capital. This capital is in closed-end funds and has relatively long maturities, usually 10 to 12 years. Diversified firms have a mix of private equity and private credit, and as a result, they have slightly lower EBITDA than pure play private equity firms due to the lower private credit fees in the mix and the generally shorter maturities of the private credit funds. Credit-focused firms, which are primarily a mix of hedge funds and CLO managers, They're more sensitive to capital market moves owing to their slightly higher portion of portfolio holdings that are held in publicly traded assets. And as a result, they can be more sensitive to the broad-based market declines like we saw in 2022. And then rounding out the strategies, we have traditional wealth management firms, which are the most tied to public market valuations. They tend to be more open-ended and they generally operate with smaller management fees. So these differences partially feed into the rating diversity that Asha mentioned across the asset manager space. It bears noting that despite these strategy differences, 
we observe that our rated asset managers appear to have appropriately sized their debt deals relative to the size of their management fees. And their earnings forecasts look to be based on pretty achievable AUM growth expectations. So as such, they've baked in relatively strong performance metrics over the life of their outstanding bonds. Now, turning it over to Leah, how does KBRA dig in and evaluate the investor bases? Sure. So some of the key areas we evaluate include single name concentrations, investor composition by type and geography, investor re-up rates for subsequent funds, and the average number of fund products per investor. And all of these factors are key in cultivating a dependable and diversified investor base and also underpin an asset manager's ability to successfully build and retain AUM. This becomes even more paramount during stressed conditions to ensure managers have sufficient capital to support business flows and to deploy as environment-led opportunities emerge. Diversification is particularly important when market disruptions occur as similar investors may mirror each other in terms of behavior and sentiment during turbulent market conditions and amid evolving market views. And it is our view that managers able to take advantage through down cycles and adapt to evolving market sentiment, including traversing ESG considerations, for example, are poised to grow and attract new investors. So who are the key LPs that are across KBRA's rated universe? And how do you see these LP compositions evolving over time? Sure. So by investor type, the KBRA rated universe is primarily represented by pension funds at about 36%. And this remains largely representative when narrowing in on the various types of asset managers that we cover, including PE-focused, those with mixed strategies, and credit-focused managers. Management teams have most commonly discussed growth opportunities within sovereign wealth and insurance channels. And we have also seen incremental shifts towards these segments for a portion of our rated names, with sovereign wealth accounting for roughly 14% and insurance at 8%. Over the longer term, firms have noted significant untapped capital and interest from high net worth and retail channels. Although most private equity and private credit managers are taking a cautious approach towards expansion in these investor groups, given the heightened regulatory costs and potential for greater regulatory scrutiny. Also, while there was some positivity following the SEC's August 2020 adoption of amendments surrounding the definition of accredited investor and qualified institutional buyer, There are still many questions surrounding investment minimums, fee structures, and liquidity requirements for high net worth and retail investors. And that continues to warrant a measured approach by managers. But overall, we expect the LP composition to remain largely weighted towards pension funds, though also demonstrating gradual diversification by type and geography over time. So asset management is not alone in the financial industry in terms of heightened regulation and ongoing geopolitical pressures. So where uh, geographically are managers seeking new sources of capital as a result? Well, within the KBRA rated universe, investor bases are predominantly weighted toward North America at 53%, followed by Europe at 21%, Asia at 15%, and the Middle East at 8%. And from our discussions with various management teams, many KBRA rated asset managers are looking to the Middle East and parts of Asia for expansion opportunities such as Japan, while there is also heightened sensitivity to China following increased regulation. We're also seeing managers look to parts of Europe, though very cautious of areas strained by geopolitical pressure and opportunities in Latin America as well. Great. Thank you very much. Now, let's turn our attention, last of all, and not least of all, to uh, Patricia. Perhaps maybe you can uh, discuss the fundraising environment and what are the opportunities available to private equity firms for us. Sure. The exit environment has slowed since the first half of 2022, and we have seen extensions, including pushing final deadlines for new funds. Owing to the LP denominator effect, private asset valuations have performed better than the public asset counterparts, particularly in 2022, which has caused many LPs to pause and reconsider portfolio allocations and weightings. LPs are looking for ways to rebalance or find liquidity, including accessing the secondary market, portfolio leverage collateralized fund obligations, and GPs taking on NAV loans to provide distributions. 
In 2023, more favorable portfolio exits and realizations arose, including some unique deal structures as GPs look to complete deals despite higher financing costs. Although activity is expected to remain muted, at least in the near term, given higher for longer interest rate policies and economic and geopolitical uncertainties. Activity in Europe is likely to continue to be supported by the valuation gap between European assets and those in the US and the strength of the US dollar. Many managers continue to invest in emerging markets, such as India, Asia Pacific and Africa, and many P firms have ample dry powder. While there have been some reports of pressure by LPs to deploy capital through the down cycle, KBRA rated managers have reported that their LP bases remain patient. Firms are seeking opportunities in the secondary market to deploy capital and generate liquidity, and there is a stronger deployment and fundraising activities in infrastructure, transitional energy, and other ESG-focused strategies. Great. So if we take a look at and consider valuations in the current environment, they've been quite volatile in the public space. How have public valuations performed versus private valuations? Yeah, following strong public markets through most of 2021, the significant gap between the reported valuation of private companies and that of listed companies widened considerably. This gap narrowed in 2022 in tandem with a sharp decline in public markets. Although some widening has occurred in 2023, as public markets have rebounded from market lows. Technology and software transaction activity peaked during the M&A boom in 2021 and first half of 2022, but began falling in the second half of 2022. And some of the largest declines in company valuations since then, particularly in the public markets. Private company valuations have been less volatile than listed counterparts. In 2023, there have been several take private transactions, especially in the technology space by leading PE firms. Many of these firms were net sellers of technology focused assets in 2021, harvesting sizable realized carry in that year. You mentioned already that the current macroeconomic environment has slowed deal activity. Has this environment brought any other major new developments? Well, inflation data has improved, although economic growth challenges and high interest rates remain for many developed countries. However, managers can deploy capital over multi-year periods while receiving large base management fees on committed capital. Credit platforms, particularly those with durable structures, can take advantage of the current environment by underwriting private credit transactions with considerably better pricing and terms compared to 2021. Fund managers are entering a more mature stage and are expected to consolidate over the next decade amid the challenging fundraising period, elevated interest rates, and increasing regulatory costs. Management teams are using acquisitions to achieve diversification and scale in strategies with long-term fundraising and investment tailwinds, such as infrastructure, transitional energy, secondaries, and private credit. And some recent examples of deals announced CVC, who purchased a majority stake in DIF Capital Partners, Bridgepoint's acquisition of Energy Capital Partners, TPG's acquisition of Angelo Gordon, and the sale of Aberdeen's US private market business to High Vista Strategies. Thank you very much, everyone. As we have heard, in KBRA's view, despite a more challenging landscape, the industry outlook remains favorable for continued, albeit at a more moderate pace, assets under management, and fee-paying assets under management growth, particularly among asset managers that have strong performance track records and can offer compelling strategies beyond traditional equity and fixed income funds, as well as limited mark-to-market volatility. The resiliency of larger managers is enhanced by multiple funds, strategies, and fund vintages combined with portfolio company and geographic diversification. While market activity has remained subdued since the boom in 2021, the industry reflects significant levels of dry powder, positioning many firms to take advantage of the environment-led opportunities in the current time. Moreover, we anticipate continued growth of private credit as banks have retreated from the space and growth in areas of infrastructure and ESG, which continue to generate LP interest. You can find greater detail in the recently published report on our website. Make sure you are registered to receive our latest commentaries and have subscribed to our podcast. And of course, make sure you give us a review. Please reach out and engage with our experienced analysts. 
Thank you very much for listening. We look forward to bringing you more conversations in European credit. Best of luck to you all out there as we navigate through this challenging environment. Thank you.